<laughs> you could sit in the middle. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for what has been, I'm sure for some of you, a bit of a long line to get in, and uh, maybe a little bit of wait for others. I don't think I can recall ever seeing this auditorium this full. <laughs> and I've been at NIH for 20 years. <laughs> so that says something about the person who is sitting to my left, who I think all of you want to hear from, uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. This is also a special occasion because this is the annual cultural lecture at NIH, which is given every year and which honors the memory of Ed Rawl, uh, somebody who is such an important leader, a mentor, a role model uh, for so many people at NIH in his long time here as a really significant scientist uh, who did many things to make this place what it is. And I know there are many members of the Rawl family here. Maybe I could ask them to raise their hands so you could see where they are. I see oh. them right over here. His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama was born in 1935 uh, to a farming family in eastern Tibet, recognized at the age of two as the reincarnation of the previous 13th Dalai Lama. He describes himself as a simple Buddhist monk. He's the spiritual leader of the Tibetan people, and I would add a voice, a moral voice, uh, for all of humanity. His commitments, uh, as on his website, promotion of human values, such as compassion, forgiveness, tolerance, contentment, self-discipline, promotion of religious harmony and understanding among the world's major religious traditions, and preservation of Tibet's Buddhist culture, a culture of peace and nonviolence. He received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1989 for his consistent resistance to the use of violence in his people's struggle to regain their liberty. And in that acceptance speech, he talked about science, which I think is interesting for this crowd. With the ever-growing impact of science on our lives, he said, religion and spirituality have a greater role to play, reminding us of our humanity. There is no contradiction between the two. Since 1987, he has hosted in his place in India Mind and Life Conferences, which for a week-long gathering bring together scientists, philosophers, uh, Buddhist monks, many others, uh, to talk about the life of the mind, to talk about science, uh, to talk about all of the deeper questions that we at NIH are also pretty interested in. And if you want to read more about his view, I hope you'll pick up a copy of his book called The Universe in a Single Atom. Uh, came out 10 years ago, but in reading through it the last few days, it's just as fresh now as it was in that time. So we are, I think, incredibly fortunate to have him with us, and I will get out of the way now and invite His Holiness uh, to say whatever he wants to share uh, with this distinguished group of scientists, and then we'll engage in a bit of a dialogue based upon questions that you all submitted by email, which I have in a little collection here, and we'll see how that goes. Your Holiness. <coughs> Indeed. Uh, extremely happy. Yeah. I think this famous of the institute, institution. I really uh, feel good honor. Hmm? Is it working? Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> what I learned, I think almost the first time, I usually see felt the controller is here. So controller damage, and then this movement difficult. So now I learned training here, change controller. <laughs> I want to know more from Richard Davidson. 
Uh, how it work? <laughs> oh, yes. Mechanism. What is the mechanism? Oh. Yes. So really wonderful. And then that twin girl, uh, the one girl, because of the uh, damage, and then the cult movement. But her eyes very sort of fresh, positive. His Holiness saw a demonstration just a few minutes ago of a 13-year-old girl with cerebral palsy who is in our rehabilitation lab with some very high-tech analyses of how her motor problems connect with what's going on in the brain and how training uh, on the elliptical and some other things they're doing is improving her legs functioning and maybe reprogramming the motor part of her brain. So is once confirmed as my belief, science truly is in making a sort of contribution for well-being and cure. Really wonderful. Uh, and then, about science and technology, since my childhood, I have keen interest. Actually, uh, I found, I found, I happy spend more time with my some machines. Oh, one old, uh, I think, sick generator. So quite often broke. So a lot of work. So instead of spend more time for reading or study or text, I prefer some manual work. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I develop interest about technology, these things. Once I got some small machines, or mainly toys which can move like that, then I play a few moments, and then out of my curiosity, I always open, dis uh, dis dismantle it. Dismantle and how it work. So then, 1954, when I was in Peking or in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in mainland China, so when I, when you see, we visit uh, different sort of the factories, huge hydro electricity, Hydro, 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 hydro uh, and then also you see different sort of factories. Most of my sort of delegation, some old officials, and also including my two tutors, they really boring. I think I was the only person fully alert. See, oh, what it work. <laughs> so. Uh, so then, after 59, gradually, I had the opportunity meeting with more scientists. That particularly last, now around 30 years, we had a regular sort of meeting with scientists. Uh, it's really wonderful. Uh, I think I may mention, you see, one good thing is, of course, their knowledge really make tremendous sort of contribution for uh, human well-being. Uh, then also, I notice among the scientists, they don't care what their uh, nationality or, or color or uh, sort of believer or non-believer. I think genuine some kind of internationalism. It's a wonderful. Just I received one sort of cousin, the book drawing by some young children. I opened one sort of it's a bending drawing by by children. One world Tagordo Pugidus. 
children. I really uh, suggest much strong. I myself totally dedicated uh, promotion of sense of oneness of seven billion human beings. Yes. I am one of them. So if we have uh, on the basis of sense of oneness of humanity, then I want a happy life, no long suffering. They also want a happy life, no long suffering. On that understanding, how can we create more problems to others? All forget others' well being. Just think oneself. So, the real sort of troublemaker with that kind of self centered attitude don't care about others' right, about others' well being. So, so these children doing, oh, I really felt oh, this is a sign of hope. We sometimes, elder people, you may not be exception. <laughs> so sometimes we old people, too much emphasis. What faith, what race, what color, what nationality. <laughs> See, too much sort of talk about we and they, and friend, ally, enemy. This is also an additional problem. So, the scientist really, you see, uh, differences in the So, uh, the scientist has this more international, <laughs> international spirit where you really downplay the individual um, secondary level differences. This drawing by those children, mm. the wonderful. These were children at the Children's Inn who were asked yesterday to make some drawings for His Holiness. Very touching series of drawings that he now will take with him. Then, meantime, I'm, I admire science, deep respect. But at the same time, I also feel science alone, up to date, so science is the limitation of the field of sort of science no, scientific knowledge. Mm. Because of the method carry research, mainly uh, as the measurement and calculation. And mainly depend on two, three persons or third persons sort of observe, observation. Now, I think the 20th century, uh, scient through scientific research, the sci knowledge about science and technology is highly developed, but that not bring guarantee peaceful world. Even as the result of scientific finding, nuclear weapon creates a lot of fear a lot of suffering. I think in a certain pe short period, nuclear weapon act like deterrent. That may be, but during, th during th that period in Europe, no sort of, for, for no sort of, because of the, or no, or, or, no op open war or, or killing but remain constant fear. That's not genuine peace. Genuine peace must come from love, not fear. So therefore, uh, and if may I say so, some scientist, wonderful scientist, but as a person, not necessarily a very happy person, <laughs> A lot of stress and a sense of competition, jealousy. So this clearly shows the scientific knowledge alone. Uh,
will not bring inner peace. So now inner peace uh, must come through its own way, not relying on mission, but relying on our intelligence and our physical sort of product, affection, compassion. That brings inner strength, inner peace. So whether you call, whether you believe religion or not, there's no point to neglect about, uh, about inner values. Uh, I really uh, hoping, uh, hoping, not only hoping, but there are some indication. Later part of 20th century, among the scientists, medical scientists, and the brain specialist, now they begin to look deeper, deeper, deeper about what's consciousness or mind or emotion. Now, beginning of this 21st century, that trend continuously now increasing. So I think uh, within this century, I think later part of this century, science can be more complete, not only external matters, but also in a uh, in a mind or in, uh, in, in a world, mental world. So I think you can you can contribute, and I hope I think from time to time you see some sort of a seminar which uh, we carry last now uh, about thirty years. So that kind of a seminar I think really worthwhile. Uh, some sort of discussions. Uh, so that I want to, to share with you. No questions. Okay. <laughs> well, you've talked about the life of the mind, and I know, Your Holiness, you've spent a lot of time with neuroscientists. In Buddhism, as I understand it, there is a very important difference between sentient beings and beings that are not sentient. So consciousness is a very important aspect uh, of the Buddhist's perspective. Neuroscience is trying to understand consciousness. Many scientists have tried and so far failed. But if neuroscience were able to actually discern in physical and chemical processes what is the basis of consciousness. How would that change your view of the mind? How should we think about that? No, uh, not only Buddhist, uh, but uh, ancient Indian spiritual tradition where the uh, practice of single-pointed meditation or, and analytical meditation. All these, not physical exercise, physical training, but mental training. First level, mindfulness. Usually, you see, we have no ability to control your mind. Mind always movement. Through training, uh, your mind can be fixed on one particular sort of object, not necessarily external object, but mental, mental level. So that we call single-pointed meditation. Then analytical meditation, analyze. That scientists also do that. Analyze, analyze, investigation, investigation. So the investigation uh, not external matters also, but mainly mind itself. <coughs> Through that way, training our mind. So physical, year by year, change. Uh, but mind, broadly speaking, continuously. So the knowledge which we learn very young age 
if you properly train, then tell even you see very, very old, 100 year old mind, very clear, very sharp. So not much depend on physical condition. Physical may be because of the weak, but through training of mind, mind can remain very sharp. That shows you could shave us in loss if we as was John So what this indicates is that um, the, the, the mental world has a, a, a characteristics that when you train, it has its own kind of laws. Oh. So I think uh, maybe, maybe a little bit because of the presumptuous. Uh, presumptuous. Yeah. Presumptuous. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I think last 30 years, serious sort of engagement with scientists. <laughs> I think some change among the scientific, so scientist way of thinking, not change our way of thinking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's pointing to Dr. Richard Davidson, who's here from Wisconsin, who's done some really interesting work about uh, what happens in the brain during meditation and certainly taught the Long scientists time, my, something. My friend, uh, and also actually when we work the inner values and I'll say the, uh, the mental world. I'll say the, in order to bring more happier person, happier humanity with inner values and also scientific knowledge. In, in that respect, I consider two hands. My side, one hand, like Richard Davidson, the scientist, another hand. Without either, I think then, cannot, cannot sort of the develop Very nice. holistic way. So I really admire, because I appreciate, appreciate many of my scientific, so sci scientists, sort of, uh, friends. Wonderful. And one, one thing, their mind, you see, they are quite neutral. Uh, and they look anything more objectively. <laughs> That's good. Otherwise, there's some the religious people, there's sometimes there's too much sort of biased view. That creates sort of conflict among believers. So the scientist, very open mind, and in the meantime, skeptics. That's very important. In order to carry investigation, skepticism, doubt, highly necessary. So, very good. Another more philosophical question about altruism. Do you think science has been able to explain or will be able to explain human altruism? Is it the nature of humanity to be selfish or compassionate and altruistic? I think science uh, more precise. Up to now, science of up to now, it's mainly focusing material field, matters field, yes. or, or subatomic level like that, genome, these things. You know? So, uh, investigate on that and try to know fully about consciousness. So science further developed, further developed. I think later part of this century, I think as I mentioned before, you know what I'm saying? I think later part of science, I think can be the field of scientific research becoming more wider, wider, including consciousness. That I believe. So up to now, the, the, the science as, as it is uh, understood today. Oh. I think limited mm -hmm. to know, difficult to explain. 
thoroughly about consciousness. Wow. And also uh, difficult, perhaps, to explain the nature of human generosity. I mean, oh, yes. what, what, would you that? I think. I think not necessary to ask scientists. Use common sense. <laughs> hmm? We, everybody, come from our mother. Anyone, including those great scientists, come from because of the different sort of particle? No, I don't think. Come from mother. <laughs> so all received the maximum affection, love from our mother. Mm -hmm. So even a physical structure, healthy physical structure, also related to it at that, at that period, mother's affection, mother's own milk, I think immense because of the important factor to proper development. One my uh, uh, friend, one scientist, Livingston Kaza. Robert Livingston, the late oh. Robert Livingston bi biologist. No, no longer. Uh, you see, he told me just after birth, next few weeks, mother's physical touch, the child, is a very crucial factor for proper development or enlargement of brain. Mm -hmm. That's the biological factor. Not come from religion. Not come from education. Biologically, uh, our life starts that way. So the experience which we gain from mother's affection, mother's love, really absorbed in our blood. So, more compared a person who is surrounded with love, you really feel happy. If you are surrounded, oh, what's the day? Dollar notary, dollar. If you, if you surround yourself with a bunch of dollar notes, oh, oh, you may not feel safe. Even you seem more worry. Oh, someone may take these dollars. <laughs> so therefore, everybody really appreciate others' affection or kindness. And we are social animal. The very structure. You see, the individual's survival depend on the rest of the community. So mentally, so bring together community, uh, money, yes, temporarily, <laughs> or power, or gun, opposite. <laughs> so real factor to bring together is love, friendship, friendship entirely based on trust. Trust based on love. No matter. Uh, without that, even very smart mind try to cheat, try to take advantage on other. No matter much smile or some or, or gift. Even animal, they know. That I also have the experience. Some dogs or cats. If I give some food, different motivation, they know. Oh, not very happy. They may take the food, but never show genuine friendship. If you show them sincere, I think they also you see, know. I think some ability they know, judging your eye, whether sincere, sincere or not. So even animal, you see, appreciate our oh, affection, come together. So therefore, person, uh, including animal, 
who receive affection, who, who feel very happy to receive kindness, kindness or affection, then they also have the ability to show compassion to others. So therefore, anger, hatred, fear, also part of our mind, but not dominant. The dominant is love. Mm. So therefore, we can say basic human nature is I feel more compassionate. The only thing is, when we are young, the, the natural sort of the, uh, condition there, you see, sort of uh, very, very uh, 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 alive with these basic human values. Then, uh, uh, grown up, I think mainly our existing education system is not adequate. The other part, other sort of human sort of ability, intelligence, or these things, you see, uh, develop in education with help of education. Uh, then, uh, the basic human values, then what do you call dormant? Become dormant. Uh, become dormant. No further develop. Mm. Then eventually, our society, materialistic sort of life, materialistic sort of culture. So then, people, people who grown up that kind of sort of atmosphere, that kind of culture, and no other sort of effort to further sort of develop this basic value, mm. basic quality. Mm. Mm. I think that's the cause of that. That's, that's a problem. So basic human nature is, I feel, uh, uh, more positive, I feel. Let me ask I, you. I saw you know, one picture, I think during the Second World War. Uh, one soldier, I think, I think Greek, Greek soldier, I think, one soldier, you see, helping the enemies, I mean, soldier of the enemy, dying of, because of marine image. Those were judge. Holding on to uh, the soldier from the enemy, enemy side. Mm. Oh, so that shows real human nature. Mm -hmm. Although secondary level, there's enemy. you deliberately shooting. But human level, they're also human being. So when so the suffering, so but nature's of response helping. Hmm. Hmm. Like that. Many of the scientists. But if you have further argument, uh, we could. I'm ready. I'm ready to argue. <laughs> <laughs> I actually like your answer a lot, so I'm not going to argue at all. Because, uh, <laughs> <laughs> So I often you see telling people the uh, we trained the Nalanda tradition use a lot of because of that debate. debate. So although my uh, training not adequate as I mentioned earlier, uh, most time when the uh, 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 prime age uh, 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 most of the time I spend some different things <laughs> and play. <laughs> However, I think uh, I also used to train that way. So, according to our training, raise question, 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 and try to find contradiction. So, in order to raise contradiction, you must be skeptical. Yes. Talk to. And then raise question, question. Then debate. That's a great philosophy for scientists and for humans in general. You know, you are such a representation of the purpose of life being happiness. You've written about this. Hmm? Do you ever get mad? Do you ever have a bad day? Bad day? 
Of course. <laughs> uh, quite often, often I, I lose my temper to small, small things. More serious things, serious matter, almost none. The intellectual level, yes, radar, this is serious. We have to find ways and means to overcome that. But deeper level, we can, we can uh, uh, maintain calmness. Mm -hmm. So small, small things, small, uh, uh, I may sort of uh, repeat you see, one of my past experience or stories. Many years ago, I think, maybe 10 years ago, one time in New York. Uh, Times. Uh, in the New York Times. Columnist. No, Col uh, columnist. Columnist. One lady uh, interviewed me, and then uh, one question she asked me, what do you want your legacy? For your legacy? Uh, I told her, I'm a Buddhist monk, Buddhist practitioner, should not think about my name. And then she uh, shifted some other point questions. Then again she asked that, the same answer. <laughs> then again go some other topic. Then again, third time she asked me, then I lost my temper. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm not going to ask the same question again then. <laughs> Yesterday also, you see, one of my, of course, the leader, the staff member, I mean, because of the leader, uh, he see, mentioned you see, some, something. I think three, four times repetition. I got a little irritation. Don't, don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Your Holiness, we know that a plane is waiting for you uh, oh, yes. to take you to Frankfurt and then on to India. Maybe one just last uh, general question. What would you say are the benefits to scientists in engaging in dialogues uh, with the contemplative traditions like Buddhism? What, what can scientists learn from conversations like this? Should we do more of this? Hmm. Right from the beginning, I made clear when our sort of a discussion with scientists or dialogue with scientists, some people use the word Buddh dialogue, Buddhism, between Buddhism and science. And I reject it. That's wrong. What we carry some sort of dialogue is Buddhist science and modern science. Buddhist science mainly mind, emotion, these things. When we de sort of describe these sort of emotions, no sort of, no concept of good or bad, simply what is reality. So that's science. So Buddhist science, uh, although you see uh, include the about particles or matters, these also you see mentioned, but compare models of knowledge, modern science, uh, very rough because they're very gr grosser. Quite gross, quite uh, um, rudimentary. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so we uh, find immense benefit learning from uh, scientific findings. And then about a matter of consciousness or mind or emotion, then ancient Indian sort of psychology, very rich. So compare that. Uh, if you give me permission, then Western psychology is like kindergarten, <laughs> very beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that was a good answer, Your Holiness. <laughs> All the Western psychologists are feeling a little put down, but I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure they will learn so, from this conversation. So as a yes. part of research about mind, then some training, the method of training of mind, and some meditation. A contemplative practice. These things. 
not as a part of religious, religious practice. And that, that I think important. Thank you. Well, I also want to thank the translator uh, who's been so helpful, uh, Thipton Jinpa, uh, who has helped us uh, make sure we were getting the, the transmission of information. Uh, thank you very much, thank Jinpa. You, thank you, thank you. But let me especially now ask you all to thank His Holiness, uh, the Dalai Lama. Thank you. Very troll. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.